Good afternoon, another wonderful episode of In the Clock Tower. I'm Pastor Chris with uh, St. John's Lutheran Church in beautiful Gillette, Wisconsin. And we're going to go through another lesson for In the Clock Tower. This is the uh, Sunday School. We use the SEED uh, program through solo publishing. Uh, and I will have, you can look on there, make sure you can download that sheet if you didn't receive it in the mail. Uh, that way you can follow along and get the questions on there. We're continuing on in the studies here as we look forward and look ahead. Uh, we're going into Ruth at this time, so we got quite a bit uh, to cover. I'm going to say this last, uh, this, this class this morning uh, was just a blast. Really enjoyed it. I, uh, it was, uh, I mean, I always enjoy getting into the word and uh, there are times though, just things uh, just seem to just make you go, oh, this is great. Uh, and uh, this morning just seemed to be uh, really alive with discussion and quite enjoyed it there and enjoyed my time. Uh, it's always fun to be able to grow together in the word and be able to study what God is saying and doing and actually look at it in our life and get a good discussion going. Um, so I'm looking forward to just to continuing on with this. Um, I also want to let you know about something else that's coming up and this could, uh, this could be something if you'd like to be involved with, it'd be great because we use this program that's through Sola Publishing. They do all the curriculum and they put it together and, uh, I've always had it in my heart, my passion. I know when I was studying youth and family ministry while I was in seminary, uh, I was at a large congregation and uh, I worked with the uh, with uh, the director for the middle school ministry uh, at the church I was at at the time, and we put together a curriculum along with packets that within that packet that we'd send home with the kids to go through with their family throughout the week. One of my great desires and passion uh, passions has always been is to. Uh, use the use the studies and things that we do as a church on Sunday mornings as a springboard uh, to be able to have further discussions throughout we, uh, the week, particularly with families, because uh, families need to have uh, things to be able to connect to with one another centered in the Word of God. Uh, so often the, uh, the television and other activities tend to get in the way of a lot of family discussion, the family time. I know it's always a struggle in my own house too, uh, but because uh, there are just so many things that are pulling us in different directions. But it is good as a family to make sure that you take periods of time to be in the Word with one another, to talk about what God is doing and have those discussions and do so in a healthy, positive way. So I'd like, uh, I'm hoping if if you'd like to be a part of this, um, my thought is, is I have done it in the past where I'm the main person uh, that is written. Now, that gets a little tiresome for me at times. Uh, not that I don't mind doing it, but uh, the blessing can be even greater for the more hands that are involved. And uh, God put it on my heart and I shared it with the uh, Christian ed team. And my thought was that we have, since we already have the curriculum already set, we all we need to do is in the week have opportunities to give points of discussion and maybe devotions and things like that that can be put together. Uh, and all that simply is is sharing thoughts with others. So if there's uh, people, uh, if you're out there and maybe you like to write from things from time to time or you'd love to dig deeper in the scripture and kind of share what you're thinking, here's an opportunity to do that because I can work with you as long and with those that desire to do it to give guidance and help with that. Uh, I, I'm sure that the, God can put the Spirit in you to write it. Uh, but when you do it, it opens up the Scriptures in a different way because you're reading it and you read it deeper usually. You look at it in different ways. You look at it with different insights. And you might have some things that God puts on your heart that, that may be different from what others have seen or look within the scriptures. It may also rise more questions that you can even ask others to talk about and discuss uh, and be able to bring it 
a lot, bring the word of God to life. My goal and the goal of the Christian ed team would be is that we would uh, assign that in the spring. And then in the fall, when we come together over the summer, uh, and when we come together in the fall, what we'll do is have a, a booklet that'll be put together that will go out to everyone in the congregation that would like one to be able to take home with them to study uh, throughout the year. And also anybody that may come and join us in church and things like that would be able to have a copy of that too. And if the, if you watch online and you're not in the Gillet area, but you still enjoy this, uh, you would be welcome to be a part of it too. Cause we just, it's about getting into the word and really just wrestling with it together. And we learn more from that, don't we? Uh, so that was just something I want to put out there for you. And if you're interested in doing that, you can always send me a, you can send me an email. Uh, you can make a comment on the comment section on for the YouTube or for the Facebook. Uh, and you can just talk about it uh, and be able to just have a discussion uh, with yourself and with others on this. So uh, before we start this, I want to, I'm going to, open up with our opening prayer for this lesson here, and uh, let's just pray together. Faithful God, you are always faithful to us. Thank you for lifting up people in our lives to whom we can show loyalty and love. Help us to recognize our need for one another as your people shape us into those who love and care for the people with whom we share our lives. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. And here's kind of the theme verse for today's lesson is, is where you go, I will go. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Ruth 1 verse 16. So as we continue to move on through this lesson here, uh, I, I just want to have us open our Bibles. And I'm going to open up my Logos screen. And then if you have your Bible, follow along your Bible. If you, and you can always look at the Logos screen too. Logos is a, is a tool I use uh, to continue on when deeper in the study. Um, so let us look at our Logos here. And we're going to start with the first verse of the first chapter of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and had given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may rest, you may find rest each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. You will go. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb, that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. 
and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or, uh, or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her. She said no more. So, so here we go. Now, so we've completed that. Uh, there's a lot that's going on in here. Now, many people probably are very familiar with this. If you've read the Bible any time or a few times on there, it's got a great, uh, a great telling there. Some of the initial impressions that I, that was asked that when asking us on the reading these verses, what are some of your initial impressions and questions? What stands out to you? Where you go, I will go. And, uh, Ruth's faithfulness to Naomi. Those are some of the things that people put out there. Um, this is a very powerful portion of scripture, and it's really good to really get into and study. It's interesting in how it is set apart, and there's so many little areas in here that are are just beautiful when you uh, break into it and you start to parse through it. I did want to share something that did come out in a study today. As we last week, we did some uh, study on the fall uh, of the when the wall of Jericho fell, and uh, yeah, it was a good question, and it was one of these things that uh, really to think about um, is you know the marching around with the loud sounds of the marching could that have caused the the stones to possibly shift and help the walls to fall uh, where when they shouted and things. And, you know, it's always good to kind of think about, well, you know, there's some factors. God does use us, his people, uh, to be able to do things. Um, and, and, you know, honestly, it's a good question. As long as, and I want to say, if you have questions like that, those are, those, there's nothing wrong with that. Because honestly, if you care about the Bible, as long as you're not trying to explain away the word of God, questions are always a good thing to kind of help and go deeper. How did God work here? Now, of course, we're not going to have all the answers because, uh, 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 well, we're not God. So, um you know, we will eventually have all the answers, but the more we dig deeper and go and search in the scriptures and, and where there are things that don't really give us the answers, well, we can always put them as questions in our head, as notes to go, well, how did that happen and how did that work? Now, one thing about Ruth that's really an interesting fact on Ruth is uh, we don't know exactly when Ruth was written, where in this period there that she was. Uh, there are some there's some studies and things like that um, that uh, you know as like uh, the notes that I would read from the uh, Lutheran Study Bible from Concordia Publishing House. Uh, they would argue that the Ruth was likely written during David's reign. Um, but that doesn't mean uh, the events happened during David's reign. And we don't really know uh, because it would have been something that would have been carried on for many, probably as a tradition, if not, uh, uh, if not uh, um, uh, as a tradition, if not written earlier. So it could very well have been written earlier. We, we really, it doesn't say. Uh, the date in which we understand it to be written was probably about 1000 BC. But that again is kind of, uh, we're, we're just trying uh, to look at the form of the language uh, and the style of, you know, style of writing and things of that nature to help us. But see, it really in the end is, is not the most important. That's just kind of things to be able to get into and start to go deeper and try and understand uh, the people. There's such a, 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 a dichotomy. There's a uh, things going on where uh, you're, you're looking at Moab versus Bethlehem. Moab. Moabites are, are the descendants of Lot's daughters, or Lot and his daughters, the incestuous, incestuous relationship that happened to them uh, while they were in the cave with their father. The daughters uh, were in the cave with their father and 
or children of their fathers to themselves. Those are the Moabites. They weren't people that were really looked well upon by the people of Israel. There is no, uh, there is no real, um, uh, uh, forbidding of the marriage, intermarriage of a Moabite and a, and a, and a person of Israel, a Jew or a Hebrew. Uh, though, it, the, the, if a man married a Moabite woman, his he would his family line would not be included within a good Jewish family line. Like they wouldn't be able to go to the temple and be in the high areas uh, in the temple. There's specially set apart areas in the temple for ten generations. Their family would be uh, separated out from being able to really go in and take part in many of the sacrifices and the ceremonies. So the the real real thing is is you know there it wouldn't have been something that would have been uh desirable for a family in that um because of of uh Moabites were not looked at as positive uh people to be around though there was no prohibition um like there were for the tribes of Canaan and the like Elimelech, uh, the name is my God is King, um, the, and uh, and it does leave a promise as we think about what uh, God is going to care for uh, Naomi. God has a plan. Um, we see um, that's where we go into the first discussion question. We see what it, what was the name of Naomi's husband Elimelech, and what were the names of Naomi's sons. Uh, and that was uh, Malon or Malon and Kilion. Um, now Malon and Kilion uh, were uh, definitely uh, did not have a good long life. <laughs> they were not strong. Uh, they struggled. Um, as we look at their names in the in the in the root of it all, as they're taking their sojourn. Um, let's see here. I'm gonna pull up and look at some notes that I have here. Um, so when we think about what Malon and Kilion, um, son of Naomi, uh, and Ruth, um, now one of the notes that was shared is, uh, weak and, or sickly and Kilion was man of ill health or weakly was one of the arguments that was, uh, that was one of the things that they found, within their notes, talking about another class member found in her notes when talking about what those names mean. Um, now, when I look at in the Hebrew that I'm reading here, uh, uh, well, Malon would be sick and Kilion, as I look in the Strongs on that, and uh, Kilion uh would be pining, uh, would be, uh, as I look at the Strong's Hebrew translations of those names there. Um, and it's only said three times, uh, Ephrathite, uh, son, uh, that would have been the husband of, of Orpa, the deceased husband of Orpa. Um, one would argue it is also interesting as I look through the notes and the studying there is that, uh, when we think about um, the husbands of Ruth and Orpah, uh, Malon was probably not the firstborn. Kilian probably was, from what they were, what many didact as the theologian that was uh, some of the stuff I was reading. They thought that he may have been uh, Malon may have been the secondborn, but he was the chosen one since uh, he was the husband of the wife that stood by Naomi and stood by in faith. Um, and they all got sick. They all died. Uh, I mean, Malon and Kilion uh, were not born in Moab. Uh, they were born uh, before they left. But they, but uh, when their father died, um, they were left uh, and married Moabitesses, uh, probably because they probably didn't plan on doing that originally. Uh, but because uh, of the death of Elimelech, uh, they probably thought it best to stay there. Uh, so there's a, I mean, uh, you kind of look at this going, all right. And then here they leave Bethlehem, which is the 
is the house of bread. <laughs> a lot of food there. Ephrathite is the place of food. Um, so normally where they were from was a very rich area with a lot of food to eat. And they go to Moab, uh, which nor it was not known to often have all the crops, but for some reason uh, there was a drought. Uh, the, God's favor was against the people. We think maybe this was maybe seven or ten years that they were away. Uh, they weren't planning on staying in Moab forever, just until, until, uh, till everything and uh, until the famine had ended. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, probably their sojourn was lengthened because of El Elimelech's death, and then the ch deaths of his sons, Malon and Kilion. Uh, they had no children at all to leave. Uh, so Naomi was left alone, and then you have Ruth and Oprah or Orpah that are uh, without any children either. And um, it's interesting that Naomi says, go back to your mother's house, because normally you'd go back to your father's house. Uh, one, of the, one of the comments was, was maybe the fathers, their fathers would have had more than one wife, which wouldn't have been uncommon. Uh, and that's why the mother... Um, it is it is spoken of as being a difference because uh, it normally normally would not be something to say go to your mother's house usually go to your father's house because your father a father has a has control over his uh, his unwed daughters that he is under the he is the one who is supposed to care for them uh, and also uh, can marry them to others um, usually there's a dowry attached to that um, so. Now, what can, what country, the second question they ask in here is what country was the family living in when all this happened? Well, this is Moab. Uh, again, Moab, uh, they didn't have a good relationship with Israel. Um, they had attacked Israel multiple times. Uh, one of the uh, one of the things shared from another uh, study Bible in the group was uh, in a Stella of uh, that was uh, set up in one of the cities uh, by the Moabites. There is stories and tales that are told about uh, Moabites destroying Israel Israeli uh, cities and compounds. So when we think about uh, that reality, um, we're probably you know it's it's interesting to just kind of. Um, kind of realize that that there's that strong relationship uh, that often had a negative turn in there too. Um, so where was Naomi originally? Why were they there? Uh, that was the next question in the second discussion part. Uh, well, they're there because of a, a drought in Bethlehem. Uh, where was, uh, or a famine in Bethlehem, where was Naomi originally from? Well, Naomi was originally from Bethlehem. She's an Ephrathite. Um, uh, that's uh, uh, where the people of Bethlehem. Now, it did also, and I didn't mention that this morning, but it does differentiate Bethlehem in Judah because there is a Bethlehem in Zebulun also. They're two different cities and they're two different areas, but they're both the same name and they're both Bethlehem. Um, as I think about this, it just kind of makes me think about, uh, I remember doing a study or I, watching one of those uh, programs on uh, history or discovery, one of that, those channels, uh, where they were trying, they were going and visiting the sites of, uh, and wanting to find Bethlehem to basically visit the sites that are traditionally, uh, associated with, um, Jesus's birth. And they do visit, and the person there visited the, what's the traditionally known site. But then there was somebody that said, this could be an alternative site of Bethlehem, and it's it was a, a little ways away from there. And I'm wondering if, uh, if you know, because not everybody, even the ones that consider themselves scientists and and well versed, because that also came out in the in the in the class. Uh, uh, there's one of the classmates who she had mentioned about listening to a podcast, and uh, there was a direct quote from Jesus um, that was used and said uh, it was um, ah. I wish I could remember off the top, but it was a direct quote from Jesus. And 
the person said, I, I don't know, maybe I don't know who really originally said that. Maybe it was uh, Jim Carrey. And it's and it was like uh, she said she was listening, going, if I, I was yelling at the at the at the program, it was Jesus. It's for, it was God. It was from the Bible. Uh, you know, and it's so often how many in our world today don't have that context. Uh, it's really amazing. And there's so many in science and archaeology that uh, don't really, sometimes they even try and study, but they don't really, they haven't really read the Bible fully. They've read parts of the Bible, but they haven't studied the Bible. And, and uh, I'm going to tell you, it's amazing. There are things that I've forgotten that when I get back and read, and then there are things I'll study. And then like this morning, something was brought up and I guess we studied it a few weeks ago and it was brought up, but my mind isn't there. And uh, trying to remember what it was that was being talked about, uh, you know, it's amazing how much, uh, that's why it's so important to study scripture because when you're reading it and you're in the midst of it, uh, one time you'll read it and certain aspects will jump out at you. And then another time you'll read it and different things will come out. You'll see things that you didn't see the first time. And the more times you read, the more things you may see that you didn't see before. And you may, and you may be reminded of things you've forgotten about. And, and it just continually keeps the scripture alive. It is a vibrant book. It is. I mean, all of the books of the Bible. It's not just in one book, but 66 various books. And But the more you get into it, the richer it becomes, and you can never overread the Word of God. It's not like most of the most of the uh, uh, literature that we have in this world that you know, read it if one or two times and you're fine. Um, um, the Bible is one that you can you need it, you read it once and read it again, and and you're going to see things differently. And then the more you get into studying and getting in the depth of all, I know people that they spend their entire lives doing a major in-depth focus on just one book of the Bible. And even at the end of their life, they may not get everything out of it that they think they could. They'll miss points. And every time they read it, even after, like many of the writers, they will write, so they will, that, that do commentaries and things, they will find things I'm sure even after looking and reading and the more you just delve and you go deeper, how God opens up doors and opens up insight that, that you didn't because our hearts are always being worked upon by God. And that's the beauty of scripture. That's why it's good to be in study. It's good to be in uh, and talking and sharing about it with other people. Cause Oh man, I'm going to tell you, it is fun when I have others and they have other insights and they make me think and they go, ah, oh, sometimes I'll hear things. I go, I don't know if I like, and then I have to think about it going, well, you never know, uh, you know, uh, and it just, it's something to ponder because there's so much there to ponder. And God wants us to ponder his word. God wants us to wrestle in his word. Uh, the worst thing that we can do is, 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 read and then stop. Uh, and I even have to care, be careful. Now, of course, if you're trying to explain away the word of God or explain away stuff to say, well, I don't like what that says, well, then uh, you need to do a little more in, inward looking on yourself. Because the reality is, is scripture is for you and meant to speak to you, but it's not really about, it's not, it's not meant to only make you feel good. It's meant to draw you ever closer to God and deeper in his word. So I, I just want to kind of put that out there because it just is so much fun. It's been, it is, I love it. Uh, I love the studies. I'll just be honest here. I, I guess I can't say that enough. Um, the third discussion question was, when Naomi, Naomi decided to go back home, what did she tell her daughters-in-law to do? And how did Orpah respond? And how did Ruth respond? Well, first off, they they went with her a distance. And when she tells them to go back, she tells them to go back to their, their mother's house, which is an interesting, interesting push there. Uh, and and at, at first, both were saying, we're going to stay with you. We are going to stay with you. Um, and the real reality of it all is, is, uh, is, is this focus of 
And and I this there's a word that comes out in this, and I'm gonna go to my logos because I want to talk more about this because I love this this word. I, I I heard a theologian talk about this word once before, and it comes up multiple times in scripture. Uh, and just as you go deeper into it, you think about the beauty of it. In the eighth verse of uh, of Ruth, uh, chapter one, it says, "But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law." Go, return each of you to, your, to her mother's house. That's that interesting dichotomy there. We're going, returning to the mother's house. Um, May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Now, this is the interesting word, kindly, that is, is um, in Hebrew, this word kindly that's right, that's translated kindly from the Hebrew is a beautiful Greek word, or not Greek, Hebrew word, hesed. And um, let me get my, I'm going to put up a, uh, a version, I'm going to put up my Hebrew up here, because I didn't do that earlier, but I'm going to pull up my Hebrew in here. Uh, let me see here, I'll look through my books. Sorry, I didn't think about this earlier, but you know what? I just want to just bring up the Hebrew. I know most of you may not read the Hebrew, but it's always good to look at the Hebrew. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay, that's Hebrew Bible. And I apologize. I did not pull it up earlier. Um, let's see here. Oh, come on. Give me my Hebrew here. Let's see. I've got the constituency Hebrew. All right. In a linear. I don't want the in a linear. Commentary. Don't need the commentary. I. Here it is. This is the Biblia Hebraica. This is the Stuttgart. Densia, uh, Stuttgartensia version. That means it was just one that was found in Stuttgart. Um, but, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this where it's linked here, so that way you can actually see right here. Now Hebrew goes this way here, um, but the term that I'm looking at, uh, that I'm, I'm I want to go through is, like I said, it's the Chesed, right, right there. Uh, that would be, uh, okay. And, uh, all right. That's, uh, okay, there we go. And as we, as we look at this term, Here we go. Here's the Hesed. Um, okay. So, uh, uh, this term Hesed, or Hesed, is, is, is really, um, so often it's just, uh, you know, kindly. It is a steadfast love. It is uh, kindness, uh, enduring mercy, enduring care. It is a, like... The closest we could think of in in the that I could think of would be uh, as we know about the Greek and agape. But what I've really loved about this term, and I'm gonna see if I can pull up even more of a breakdown of the Bible word study. There we go. That's what I want. Um, well, uh, let's see. So. Joint obligation, loyalty, faithfulness, favor, faithfulness, goodness, graciousness, godly, a goodness, kindness, obligation to the community, loyalty, faithfulness, favor, faithfulness, kindness, grace. Go. There's some other here of what we... Um, now, if one were to turn away from hesed, they would bring shame and disgrace. That's the, that's the awful thing. So the opposite of that. So... Um, but in the great in the grand scheme of what we're speaking about is what 
Naomi, what uh, Ruth is pouring and what uh, Naomi is giving as a blessing to their daughters is saying, asking for God's enduring love to stay with her daughters-in-law. There's great love she has for them. And she is wanting them to feel that there is this great enduring love. She is appreciative of their own, what they have given. And when we look through the scriptures, uh, when we look through on this, um, you know, the next use of this would be um, where she goes, do not urge me to leave you or return from following you for where you go, I will go and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. This is actually very strongly, this is used as our own baptismal formula. Uh, that we use uh, in the church, it kind of gives us an idea when we speak about that. Um, we are, we are, we are giving our loyalty. Uh, where you die, I will die, and and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me. So when we think of of this, this is the the parity of it all, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. So. There is that if she is not, doesn't stay and be as loyal to her, then there would be disgrace, chesed, uh, on that also um, for her if there would be any negative, uh, if she were to abandon her mother. Um, let, the, let the shame fall upon her. So it's that reverse there that's given. If my love for you is so enduring that I will stay with you. And if anything else, if anything drives me away from you, um, then let that punishment fall on me. Let that shame fall upon me. Um, as we, uh, and I, I know I was wanting to get more in there, and there's so much more that I can go on, but uh, my mind is filled with so much, and I want to get through the last parts of this because we got through it all today. Um now, Ruth refused because her heart was drawn closer to Naomi. Uh, that would be the fourth one. Um, and in what way did they need each other, and why do all of us need other people to be a part of our own lives? Well, this is a good way of thinking about it, is she refused to part because of the love she had. She felt that she needed to be with her. Uh, she didn't see the hope in going back to be with her family, but she was now, she had given up that side of her family, that Naomi was her family. Uh, and she claimed her so deeply that there was nothing for her to go back. And we all need to have people that we need to go to in our lives. We need to know that, uh, that, that, uh, Honestly, we should be dependent on others. Others, I mean, you think about how many people are not dependent or try to be so independent. Most of the time, they're not the happiest of people because they don't trust anybody, so they don't really have any strong, close relationships, and they're really their witness is not very good. But when we are dependent on others, we can show that it helps us also in our dependence with God, because we have to rely on God. This was a good question and a good reflection. Uh, who are people in your life, friends, family members, etc., on whom you depend the most? Take the time right now to pray and thank God for placing these people in your life. Uh, and this would be some people that you can think of that have gone on in your life. I can think of people throughout my life that have depended on. My wife is one that I, her and I depend very strongly on each other. Um, we're better together. Uh, and there are so many others out there, too. I can also think of people like my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, who I did uh, share if you listen to the message minute. Uh, my, my grandmother and I, my grandmother was not only my grandma, she was my best friend. Um, her and I talked about everything. And uh, I still miss her. Um, you know, I'm glad she's with the Lord and all, and I do have uh, confidence in my heart that she is. And my grandfather, he was somebody that I always strove to be like. Um, they weren't perfect people. No, uh, they didn't always give the greatest faith examples, but they are. But their heart and their love and who they were, um, they still shape me today. Uh, I, I think of them, and I, I always want to be uh, a grandson that they'd be proud of. Um, and uh, there are those people in our lives. Everybody 
if we sh- we have those people, that's always a good thing uh, to rely upon and lean upon. Uh, but I, it's good to reflect on that and write down their names, pray for them, uh, and just pray and thank God for them, but also pray for them. They need your prayers. Um, some people think about being dependent on others as a bad thing. However, to depend upon God is what it means to have faith. Why does God want us to trust and depend on him, and why is that a good thing? Well, one of the answers there, and this is, I guess it sums it up. He is our rock and never steers us wrong. When we trust in God, he, he'll never steer us wrong. He is a good rock. Um, now, there is a bad, now, codependency is a bad thing. Uh, and codependency is very different than dependency. Uh, dependency just says, hey, these, I, I, I am better with this other. Could I do it myself? Sure. Am I going to do it well on my own? Probably not as well as I would do it with the other. Um, that's, why, that's where dependency is not a bad thing. Uh, where you are a partnership with one another. Um, You can live without, but you're better with. That's what we're talking about is dependency, not codependency, which is a clinginess uh, and not knowing that you could go on without the other uh, because you always have to be able to move on. Um, Ruth made a promise to, to Naomi in verse 16. How is this like the promise we share as fellow believers? How is it like God's promise to us? Well, see, God promises never to turn away or forget us. That's one way to look at it. As believers, we also pray that God, uh, that that we will not turn away from God, and we ask for God's help to guide us in all those. That's one of those. Uh, that's one of the great promises that we give when we give our baptismal promise as family members. You know, one of the things I think about is, um, you know. Uh, uh, baptism, we give promises in baptism. If you're baptized as an infant or your parents made promises for you, and then as you get older, uh, you go through confirmation, you affirm those promises. So you also make those promises too. Um, the problem is, is sometimes we forget to remind each other and ourselves of those promises. As Christians, we should be constantly reminding ourselves and reminding others of the promises that are made to us in baptism, what God promises to us and for us so that we can cling to those. Because there is a great promise given to us by God. It's not that our baptism is not dependent upon us. Uh, faith is what, what, what helps us there. And we're given that by God too. And just full reliance upon that, reminding ourselves that without God, there is not much that we can do on our own. And, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and as we continually take these steps forward, as we continue to move this direction, we can always find that God is our rock. He saves us. He strengthens us. He will, he will not steer us astray. We can lean upon him, rely on him, listen to his words, trust in his promises, and just never let go. And as Christians, when we know somebody is going through struggles, the best gift we can give to another Christian is we remind them fully of the promises, saying that God has not forgotten you. In the midst of all suffering, God has not forgotten you. Uh, and for those that have been baptized, it's good for them to make sure that they raise up their children to fear and love God, fear, love, and trust God above all else. That's one of the things that we say within the within our our, our catechism as Lutherans, uh, and as we explain the first commandment, we should fear and love God above all else. That nothing else should take precedence over God. Uh, Fear, love, and trust in God above all else. Because what happens is we place our trust in other things. Sometimes it can be good things. I mean, not all the things we try and place our trust in are bad. You know, medications, vaccines, doctors, nurses, hospitals, uh, other medical professionals. We place our trust in (coughs) in our bosses to make sure that they also are taking care of us as they should, right? But we should not put them above God. We should look at those as things that God has placed in our lives so that we, we can we can always rely upon them and lean upon them, knowing that he never lets us go. He never forgets us. He never turns away. And just uh, continue to take those steps day by day to continually move on and see where God is at work. Um, so uh, then... Then with the final question we had, and I'm going to turn and I'm going to transition back to my Lagos. And um, let's see here. I'm going to turn open up another screen I had done 
uh, this over here. And I'm going to highlight the verses that we're going to read. Um, so that way you can see where we're going um, here in the yellow. Um, Romans 8, cha uh, chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. It, it says in the last question, ask us to read this. And that says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God makes a powerful promise in these verses. How would you summarize that promise in a single sentence? This was a sentence that was said, nothing can separate us from God. And that is a good promise to hold on to. No matter what happens in life, no matter what mistakes we make, no matter how far we may fall away from the faith, nothing can separate us from God. He will not tur turn away from us. He will not forget us. His hesed, his enduring love, his steadfast love, his mercy lasts forever. It's not based upon what we do. It's not based upon our actions, but it's based upon the love that God has for his creation. And that's a great promise to carry with us. In Greek, that's called agape love. In the Hebrew, it's hesed. I think it's a little deeper hesed, I believe, as I have heard and read, and it's a word that I'll study more and more. Um, but the time, I just still remember the first time having it really deeply clarified and just how rich of a word that is. Remember the hesed of our love, uh, uh, the hesed of our God, who is so loving that he, he entered his own creation. He died on the cross for each and every one of us to take upon himself our sin. Man, that's just beautiful. It's wonderful. And that's where the hope lies. That's where the promise is. It's nowhere else. No one else can promise anything more than what God has already done for us. And that, I hope, gives you hope. Because I know it gives me hope every day. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, I hope you'll have discussions on the uh, on the chat areas within Facebook and the like, uh, just to be able to discuss what it is that uh, is being said uh, within this and uh, go through it and wrestle with it, knowing that God loves you. His love is enduring. It will not fail. And until I see you again, God's blessings upon you. And uh, may you feel his peace surround you. Have yourself a wonderful rest of your day. God bless.